and will be your leading resource person for the three days uh, virtual training. For this training, I'm joined by my colleague, Stefania Bacci, who just got herself introduced. She is the one behind making all the organizational arrangements for this training and will be playing a key role of facilitator during the course of the next three days. For this training, we are expected to be joined by 171 esteemed officials from 12 countries belonging to Latin American and Caribbean region. These include Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, and Venezuela. Let me highlight that we have already collaborated with several of these countries at different stages of the methodological development process of SDG 241, especially Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, and Mexico that contributed to the indicator's methodology and its different aspects. Um, we will have a good mix of participants with diverse backgrounds, including representatives from the national statistical offices, ministries of agriculture, ministry of uh, environment and other institutions and organizations relevant to sustainability issues at the national level. In addition, we are also joined by FAO colleagues, both from the headquarters uh, here in Rome and different Latin American offices. We hope that this training will be a great opportunity for you to enhance your understanding about the fundamental building blocks of SG241 and its policy use once it's get implemented at the national level. The training will be interactive. So we gradually in a phased manner will cover the different aspects of the indicator. That is its conceptual and methodological basis, scope and coverage, the data collection and analysis tools and processes or mechanisms for reporting it back to FAO. As we move along, we will take breaks for questions and discussion and try to answer the questions that you may have. We would like to extend thanks to Mr. Michael Rahija, the regional statistician, and Ms. Alda Elizabeth Diaz Cavallo, advisor for calculation of SDG indicators, both from the FEO Regional Office for Latin America and Caribbean for their contribution in supporting us with the organizational aspects of this training, especially in making the last minute arrangements for Spanish translate, translations, we really appreciate it. Last but not the least, we would like to express our gratitude and profound appreciation to the respective, uh, respected participants who have made room in their busy schedule to attend this training in these extraordinary circumstances. We are expecting to have an active participation and constructive discussion throughout this training. Thank you very much once again. With this brief introduction, I will now leave the floor again to Stefania. Okay, thank you, Spandiyar. I personally would like to thank Michael and Alda too for their precious support and collaboration for this event. Many details have been defined at the last minute and the teamwork uh, has been priceless. I leave now the floor to Alda since she would like to say a few words too. So Alda, it's your turn. Muy buenos días a todos. Eh, gracias por acompañarnos el día de hoy. En, en esta ocasión eh, voy a dirigirme a ustedes en nombre de, de Michael y todo el equipo de la estadística de, de, de la regional. Eh, nosotros eh, tenemos un proyecto que es eh, muy importante y es el TCP 3730. Este proyecto eh, trata del mejoramiento de los censos y la encuesta agropecuaria para lo que es el cálculo de los indicadores de ODS. Vamos a trabajar con ustedes eh, todo este tiempo y, y por tanto eh, la importancia del 241 como un marco para, para eh, este, esta capacitación va a permitirnos seguir adelante con el proceso que queremos. Necesitamos eh, apoyarlos en todo lo que ustedes requieran porque queremos que, hacer esta medición y que, eh, impulsar lo que es la agricultura eh, eh, también eh, queremos animarlos a todos para que por favor aplican todo lo que aprendan y queremos que ustedes hagan este monitoreo eh, de, del indicador. 
va, lo vamos a incentivar, lo vamos a apoyar para que estén con nosotros eh, trabajando. Eh, también les impulsamos a que por favor apo, eh, llamen a las oficinas países y les pidan que le demos el apoyo que, que vamos a darle para hacer este cálculo del 241. Gracias por estar aquí. Eh, les, eh, más adelante van a, a ver a, a Michael Rajija. Eh, yo soy el líder que estoy apoyando en este proyecto, pero él es eh, nuestro estadístico regional que también nos guía. Eh, un saludo y que estén muy bien. Un éxito en este curso. Thank you very much, Alda. Um, so let me share my screen now. Okay, can you confirm you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So, thanks, Aspandayar and Alda, for their introductory speeches. Let me give you immediately, uh, quickly, a few instructions. They were already listed in the concept notes, but it's important to highlight again uh, a few. So, preferably use a PC or a laptop, and not a mobile phone or a tablet. This is because the content sometimes could be heavy to follow, so it's important to have this screen and that you are comfortable in a silent place with no background noise or echo, and that you have also a clear vision of your monitor. Please also turn off all the sounds and notifications like Skype, WhatsApp, emails, or any other. If you have connectivity issue, our voice breaks or video freeze, close the other applications that might be open on your computer. If it doesn't work, also maybe check through your house or your office, wherever you are, if you can switch off some devices. You can access Zoom from all devices, uh, both via web browser or uh, through the application but we strongly recommend to download the application for a better experience. Uh, Zoom provides new versions of the application, so it's strongly recommended to check for updates to ensure that you have the new features and uh, also to enhance the security of the application. To do so, uh, you can open the application and click on your profile picture in the top right and then you check for updates. If there is a new version, Zoom will uh, uh, let you know we download and install it. For a better sound quality, please do not use your, uh, your built-in computer microphone. Use a USB headset with integrated microphone or maybe a wired earphone and microphone, but maybe not a Bluetooth. If several participants use a unique microphone, please make sure who is speaking is close to the microphone. For future use, uh, the sessions will be recorded and probably uploaded on the SDG webpage. So in case you don't want to show your visage, please keep your camera off even when you are talking. Let's go now through a few rules. Please follow the meeting in mute mode and click the unmute button only when you are given the floor. This is because today we, have, we are more than 100. In this moment, we have 127 participants. And often can happen to have noise in the background that disturb the seniors. So we kindly ask also to have the camera switched off uh, for not overloading the internet bandwidth. You can switch on the camera when speaking. The two icons are on the bottom left of the Zoom interface. Here is the picture of the icons. Please ensure that the name of your country appears in the name box. Uh, to do this, you click on the dots appearing in the right-hand corner of your image box. 
you select rename and you insert your country name and last name. If you have a question, write in the chat box that you have one and wait for the SDG 241 team to give you the floor. Unmute yourself. Please have your video on when you're taking the floor, unless of course you don't want to. And, but please be ready to turn it off in case of poor connection. Speak loud and close to the microphone, stating your country and your question. And when finished, mute back yourself and switch off the camera. Uh, you can also raise the hand virtually for requesting the floor. You need to look for this symbol. It is the raise hand function, and you can find it in the participants menu. The floor will be passed to participants based on the order that appears on my screen, to the extent possible, of course. Uh, if many as uh, questions will be asked, we will consolidate by them by subject. And if still there are too many and we don't have time, we will answer them by email. Anyway, please be ensured that we will reply to all questions. Uh, as you know, we have requested only uh, two to five lead, lead representatives per country that are allowed to talk. We apologize, but this is needful for this kind of meetings with such big a number of participants. So if you have a question, but you are not among the lead representatives, we kindly ask you to coordinate yourself through other channel or through other application. From time to time, the SDG 241 team will ask questions as sort of quiz through the poll function in Zoom. So please don't hesitate to ask clarifications if something is not clear, since you will be asked to reply all questions. Finally, whatever issue you have, please write me, Stefania Bacci. You can use the private chat in Zoom. You can change it easily in the general chat. You just need to change the, to change the recipient name. I will be happy to help you for any kind of doubts, questions or technical issues. As you know, interpretation is available in Spanish. You can select, uh, uh, you can select it in the bottom bar. Uh, if you prefer to follow the training in Spanish, Spanish, switch on the Spanish channel by simply clicking here as it is shown in this uh, screenshot. You will hear the translation at 80% of the volume with the original speaker at 20%. So you can still hear tone and intonation uh, for a better understanding. Please be reminded that in the virtual meeting, audio quality may deter deteriorate unexpectedly and become insufficient for interpretation purposes. So our interpreters will indicate this verbally and resume interpretation as soon as the sound quality permits. Mrs. Jasmine Silva and Mrs. Andrea Lagarini are the two interpreters. You can see the word interpreter close to their names. Please pay attention to the icons. If you see the flags indicating their languages, it means that your Zoom application is not updated. So in this, clay, in this case, please update it immediately. You need to see the initials of the languages, not the flags. So that's all for now. I hope everything was clear. In case not, you know I am available through the chat. And thank you. And now let's start uh, the training. So let me stop the sharing. And I turn on my video again. So the agenda for today uh, is quite concentrated. We are going to learn uh, uh, about some of the SDG indicators, and we will concentrate, of course, on the 241 indicator. Specif specifically, we will see all the 11 sub-indicators that uh, compose the three dimensions, the economic, the environmental, and the social dimensions. Today, we should pay a big attention to all uh, that will be explained 
because it's the fundamental part of the whole training. So let's start immediately. The first session introduced the 21 uh, SDG indicators that are under the uh, FAO custodianship. Uh, as van der Jaar, you have the floor. Thank you very much. So let me just uh, turn on my, share my screen. So. Is it, is it okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So before we dive deep into the methodology of SDG 241 and start disentangling its intricacies step by step, in this very first presentation, I will give you an overview of the SDG indicators under FAO custodianship. Of course, the focus will be on the progress that we have made until so far both on the methodological and capacity development front. Um, during the course of the, this presentation, I will introduce you to our future plans for capacity development, that is technical assistance and training, support to countries collection and reporting efforts to facilitate national, regional, and global monitoring of FAO SDG indicators. Briefly, we will cover the following key points in this presentation. The 21 SDG uh, indicators under FAO custodianship and its current tier status. Our work on SDG indicators so far on various fronts, that is methodological capacity development and support to data collection and reporting. Overview of our potential future lines of work in support of maximizing data reporting on SDGs. And lastly, the presentation will illustrate important resources that we have developed, that is e-learning courses, and website links, et cetera, where you will find additional and detailed information on FAO SDGs. So let me begin by giving you an overarching and holistic overview of the global indicator framework and the process that was adopted by United Nations for its implementation and operationalization at the national, regional, and global levels. The global indicator framework comprises of 231 unique indicators and it was endorsed by the UN General Assembly in July 2017. Uh, so in order to carry forward, oversee and manage this process, the United Nations Statistical Commission was made responsible for development and, and implementation of the SDG monitoring framework and in addition, an interagency and expert group on sustainable development goal indicators, that is IAEG SDG, was constituted to prepare initial proposal on the methodology and to oversee this work until 2030. The IAEG SDG has 28 countries as members, which represent their respective regions. An important point to note is that the process with IAEG SDG and fully led by countries with international organizations only serving as observers. Based on the level of methodological development and the availability of the data, the IAEG SDG has divided the indicators into three tiers. Uh, tier one are the indicators for which are conceptually clear and international established methodology and standards are available and their data are regularly produced by more than 50% of the countries and of the population in every region where the indicator is relevant. Tier two are the indicators which are conceptually clear and international established methodology and standards are available, but data is not regularly produced by countries. That is less than 50% of the country or population in each region. And tier three, of course, the indicators for which neither international established methodology nor data exist so far. As of the 51st session of the United Nations Statistical Commission, the global indicator framework does not contain any tier three indicators. So in order to support the methodological development and monitoring process, for each SDG indicator, a custodian UN agency was identified and was assigned the, the following responsibilities. 
lead methodological development and documentation of the indicator, support capacity uh, of the countries to generate and disseminate national data, collect data from national sources, ensure its comparability and consistency and disseminate it at the global level. And lastly, to contribute to monitoring the progress at the global, regional and national levels, for example, storylines and data for annual SDG reports and agency flagship presentations. The global indicators are a core set of metrics that all countries are invited to monitor and to report to custodian agencies like FAO. The key point is if national data are not produced, regional and global indicators cannot be produced and compiled. Another important point to be noted is that the global indicators can be complemented. This is very important, but not replaced with national or regional indicators. This is as per paragraph 75 of the United Nations Resolution on 2030 Agenda. And lastly, the global monitoring is based on data produced by countries with national statistical offices having a key coordinating role at the national level for uh, international reporting. So even if the indicator estimates are produced by international organizations or custodian agencies, prior consultation, validation and triangulation is needed with countries before it is published by the international agencies. We as FAO or custodian UN agency for 21 SDG indicator and a contributing agency for five others. These indicators obviously are related to food and agriculture space. In this capacity, FAO is supporting countries efforts in monitoring the 2030 agenda. The 21 SDG indicators are spread across the following six goals that include goal two. Uh, which is on food security, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture. Goal five on gender equality. Goal six on use of water. Goal 12 on sustainable consumption and production. Goal 14 on oceans. And goal 15 on life on, on land. So as a custodian UN agency for the 21 SDG indicator, FAO mandated to or responsible for methodological development of the indicators, statistical capacity development of the countries, global data collection and its dissemination, global progress report and voluntary reviews submitted by the countries to, to, to FAO, and finally, communication and advocacy on, on the 21 SDG indicators. In terms of FAO work on SDG indicators, back in 2015, of the 21 SDG indicators, 13 were tier three. This means that FAO had to develop new methodological proposals in consultation with countries and compile it with the IAEG SDG criteria for tier three reclassification. This was the case for indicator 2.3.1, 2.3.2, 2.4.1, and so on. For some other SDG indicators, FAO has also to develop new international definitions for the key concepts. For example, definition of small scale food producers, which is indicator 2.3.1 and 2.3.2, and definition of rural and urban areas, which is going to be used for disaggregation of many SDG indicators, uh, including those which are beyond FAO mandate. The work, of course, didn't stop uh, at the methodological development stage, but continued at a fast pace, where in addition to methodological development, for all indicators under our custodianship, we develop improved data collection tools, guidelines, and supporting material, to, to facilitate countries report on the newly developed, approved and endorsed uh, methodologies. This slide summarizes the tier states of the 21 SDG indicators with the red being a tier three, yellow tier two and green tier one. Now, as of November, 2015, 
13 indicators back then were tier three, five were tier two, and only three were tier one. This meant a lot of our work back then was focused on methodological development of the indicators. Hence, given the intensity of the work involved, we as FAO realigned our work program both strategically and operationally to support the methodological development of tier three indicators. With the four years of steadfast technical work of cross-functional teams responsible for respective SDGs at FAO headquarters, while leveraging a participatory, consultative and inclusive process, and most importantly, with support from officials and experts from countries, international organizations, private sector and academia, we were able to establish methodological basis for all the remaining tier three indicators. As you may see in the matrix, currently none of the indicator remains as, as tier three. In parallel with the methodological development, lots of efforts were targeted to support countries to enable them start adopting, implementing and reporting data on the 21 indicators. This included testing of the methodologies in selected countries for finalization of its methodologies, development of e-learning courses, organization of country, regional and global training workshops, so as to build statistical capacity of the countries and development of a comprehensive uh, data and communication portal that serve as a one-stop shop for all the information on the 21 SDG indicators. Um, our new uh, FAO vision for 2019 to 2030 is of course to scale up capacity development support to maximize uh, country reporting. On the previous slide, I mentioned a training workshop. The, the aim of these workshop, including this very virtual training that is progressive now, uh, has been to invite countries to collaborate on testing of the new methods that were developed, enlarge the pool of SDG facilitate south-south cooperation amongst countries. Until so far, we have conducted three training workshops in 2017 and between 2017 and 2020 that were participated by experts from 150 plus countries belonging to all regions of the world. The ultimate focus was obviously to increase the number of data points, that is the number of reporting countries. Um, we have also worked on the capacity development front whereby we um, developed and prepared e-learning courses for almost all the 21 SDG indicators um, that are now published and available freely online on FAO dedicated SDG uh, portal or web page. These are excellent resources that will help you get acquainted with the indicators methodology, data collection and uh, reporting tools and processes at your own uh, convenience. Here are some other SDG indicators for which the courses are already available online. Um, now we are currently in process of finalizing the e-learning courses on indicator 1231, which is global food losses and 1471 on value added for uh, sustainable fisheries. One of the key feature of these e-learning courses is that uh, we have added recently a feature um, which if once you complete these courses successfully, you will be awarded a course uh, completion uh, certificate. All the information on the e-learning courses can be accessed uh, you know, using this link. Going forward at FAO, we will continue to work closely and in collaboration with our member states to pursue and implement our future activities, particularly those focused on capacity development that include 
further work on various methodological aspects of the indicator and its testing, that is data disaggregation techniques, forecasting, now casting, and small area estimation to facilitate reporting on the SDGs. Secondly, in collaboration with member mm. countries to carry out mm. data gap assessment at the national level. Thirdly, to further strengthen our engagement with the national stakeholders, particularly on the alignment of national and regional indicators framework with SDG framework. In doing so, we believe it will reduce data collection and reporting burden on the countries that already face resource constraints. Another key area of work would be to provide support in further development and implementation of new data collection tools, including alternative data sources and new means of data collection, like using cell phones and computer assisted uh, web interviews, especially given a COVID-19 pandemic, which has not only slowed down, but uh, you know, in some cases uh, altogether stalled the face-to-face -face data collection due to travel restrictions. We will continue to provide capacity development through various modalities, including through virtual trainings to support countries in adoption, implementation, and reporting of FAO SDG indicators. And lastly, um, we aim to provide technical assistance in improving the analysis and use of FAO SDG indicators in um, making informed decisions and uh, evidence-based policies at the national level. So for general information on SDGs, please don't hesitate to write to the Office of the Chief Statistician. That is uh, a unit responsible to coordinate the SDG work of FAO at the global, regional, and national level using the first email address uh, given here. For matters related to SDG 241, you can always reach out to us uh, using the dedicated email address uh, given, given here. So thank you very much. Stefania, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Sandaya, for this introduction to the SDG and the AFL world. Uh, I would like first to ask everybody, please pay attention not to turn on your microphones because we have heard sometimes uh, some people talking. So I am muting you. I'm sorry, but I need to. But please pay attention because for the interpreters, this can be uh, a problem. So, uh, so as Pandayar introduced us uh, um, the 21 SDG indicators uh, in FAO, but in this training we know we are focusing only in one, which is the SDG 241, proportion of agriculture area and the productive and sustainable agriculture. So if we don't have any questions so far, uh, I would pass immediately the floor to him again. I have already so or have already seen uh, some questions in your uh, registration phase, but I prefer not to answer them now because they are all very specific. So we will go through them uh, after Aspandiar has introduced uh, um, more uh, uh, concepts. So Aspandiar, the floor is yours again. So thank you very much, Stefania, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So, so in this presentation, we will unfold or cover SCG, two for, SCG indicator 2.4.1, which is proportion of agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture. The core objective of uh, this uh, three days uh, virtual training uh, R2 First and foremost, I will walk you through the SDG indicator 2.4.1 conceptual and methodological basis. It's a compilation and interpretation. Uh, tomorrow we will focus on the tools and instruments developed both for collecting and reporting data on the indicator. You will get to know about the survey questionnaire and related document. SDG 241 in the context of Agri Survey Program and uh, 50 by 2030 initiative. And also the FAO data collection questionnaire as an instrument used by FAO to collect data from member countries. 
And on the third day, we will discuss with you the data gaps and your concrete plans in the short, medium, and long term to collect data on the indicator in order to bridge those gaps. And lastly, an overall aim of this training is also to unite or assemble key stakeholders at the country level, those uh, who are responsible for collecting and reporting data, uh, representatives from the National Statistical Office, and also those responsible for using the data produced for evidence-based policies at the national or sub-national level. Uh, that is the representative from Ministry of Agriculture and other relevant institutions. So to contextualize, uh, as highlighted in the, in, in the previous presentation, at FAO, we develop global public goods, that is methodology standards and classifications in coordination, consultation, and close partnership with key stakeholders at all levels. So to give you some historical perspective, in early 2016, the FAO Strategic Program on Sustainable Agriculture and Global Strategy to Improve Agriculture and Rural Statistics joined forces to do, develop the pioneer methodology for the then Tier 3 SDG Indicator 2.4.1 to measure progress towards Target 2.4. Now, as many of you may know, defining and measuring sustainable agriculture, which is a multi-dimensional concept, is challenging as it is complex and country specific. And thus, despite several attempts in the past 50 years since 1970, has never been done before. Given the multidimensionality of, uh, of the sustainability concept, FAO initiated a global discussion to deliberate the fundamental questions as to what sustainability means in the context of agriculture sector, what are the fundamental building blocks of uh, sustainability, what are the economic, social, and environmental factors that affect and in turn get affected by sustainability in agriculture both in an intertemporal and interspatial way. What thematic aspects to keep as part of the framework and what to let go of? How to strike a balance between the different sustainability issues faced by different regions and countries? How it will be measured and monitored consistently over time using a framework and data collection tools that are universal? Um, that is applicable uh, to both developing and developed countries. Um, as you will uh, find out in the course of this training, the methodology that we have developed for SDG 241 is simple and involve uh, uh, basic arithmetic rules to arrive at sustainability assessment uh, of the country once the data has been collected, cleaned, processed, and, and analyzed. The approved and endorsed methodology of SDG 241 is a result of long participatory and consultative process that involved discussion with and contribution of thematic uh, and subject matter experts, statisticians, policymakers, and researchers from country institutions, that is national statistical offices, Ministry of Agriculture, international organization, civil society, private sector, and academia on, on, on the very issue I mentioned earlier. The reason behind us involving key stakeholders with diverse background was to make this indicator owned by everybody, especially countries. The current methodology of 241 embodies this principle that is it's universal, policy relevant and practical. Um, the way the methodology of this multidimensional indicator is designed and you will see that as we progress during this training is simple, logical, and practical. This was to ensure sustainability of the indicator monitoring over time at country level. So SDG goal two zero has uh, five targets. The target that we are interested in today is target 2.4, which is written in ex extensor here. As you can see, like many other SDG targets, this target is a very complex one. We highlighted in red some of the key aspects that needs to be captured as we try to measure progress to this target. Sustainability, resilience, productivity, production, 
environmental consideration, that is climate change, soil quality, etc. All these diverse aspects in one single target. Clearly, this would require that an approach that captures these different dimensions or aspect. The indicator that was submitted to IAEG STG and was approved in March 2015 is proportion of agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture. The indicator is now tier two, which means that the methodology of the indicator has now been approved um, and endorsed in, in the October 2018 meeting of IAEG STG with further refinements in the biodiversity uh, sub indicator endorsed in November 2019. Um, so the methodology for this indicator has been established. However, in general, data is not yet available or partially available. The formula we propose to measure the indicator is very simple and straightforward. It is area under productive and sustainable agriculture uh, divided by the agriculture land area. So let us focus on the denominator first, the agriculture land area. It is defined as arable uh, plus uh, arable land plus permanent crops and permanent meadows and pastures. It's a well-known and established concept um, that is collected by statistical bodies in countries and compiled internationally via questionnaire by FAO and disseminated regularly through FAO stack. The issue obviously is with the numerator of the formula. How do we measure area under productive and sustainable agriculture? What is clear from the description of the target, which I illustrated on the previous slide, we have to look at sustainability across all its dimension. That is economic, social, and environmental. Meaning the agriculture land area under productive and sustainable agriculture will be the agriculture area of those agriculture holdings that satisfy the sustainability criteria for all the sub indicators selected across all the three dimensions uh, of SDG 241. Here are the steps that were used in the methodological development of SDG 241 we discussed and chose the scale of uh, assessment for SDG 241. And the choice made for 241 was to adopt a bottoms up approach, whereby we selected farm or agriculture holding level sustainability that in turn is aggregated to the national level. Then we determined the scope of activities of the holding to be covered by this indicator. And the choice made for 241 was to cover crops and livestock activities. We reviewed the dimension to be covered and we decided to stick to the classical dimension of sustainability, that is economic, social, environmental in, this, in the sustainability assessment. Let me add here that in the beginning of the process, when we embarked on the development of the indicator methodology, we selected five dimension that included, in addition to the three already mentioned, two other dimensions that were institutional and governance uh, and resilience. However, later on, it was decided to integrate resilience with the economic, environmental, and social dimension and drop the governance on institutional dimension as we were exclusively focused on farm level assessments. We then zoomed inside the dimension into what we call themes or aspect, and in turn selected the sub indicators that are needed to measure the progress within each theme. Then we established sustainability criteria, also known as thresholds or cutoff points for each sub indicator to classify the farms and the agriculture areas it owns or operates by assigning it red, yellow, or green statuses, which we call the traffic light approach. Then the next decision was selection of the data collection instrument for collecting and reporting data on the indicator. And the choice made for 241 was to use farm survey as a unique data collection tool. 
We also discussed to decide on the periodicity or frequency for collecting and reporting data on SDG 241. And it was decided that the periodicity will be set at three years. And finally, we discussed the modality for reporting the indicator. For this, we developed both a dashboard where all the 11 sub indicators or themes are presented in one chart, uh, where each sub indicator is illustrated separately by sustainability status and an aggregate SDG indicator that can be cal calculated directly from the, from the dashboard. The principles that were used to develop the indicator. First, the policy relevance, actionability. We wanted to make sure that every sub indicator selected as part of SDG 241 framework had a meaning for the policy makers and thus provided information based on which informed decisions can be taken to improve the situation at the country level. Meaning the sub indicators must be easily understood. Uh, the primary reason as to why these are selected and the results easily interpreted by the policy makers. For example, to answer the question, is agriculture sustainability decreased and why? And which policy needs to be implemented to address these issues? Secondly, universality and comparability are fundamental. We are in SDG process, a universal process. Thus, we needed to make sure that the indicator is valid everywhere. It must be relevant for all countries uh, across the globe both developing and developed. Measurability and cost effectiveness were very high in our mind as we were trying to find a right balance between an ideal indicator from the subject matter perspective and one that can be measured consistently with a reasonable cost. The affordability of the indicator in terms of data collection and reporting was our top priority. And finally, the minimum cross correlation amongst the sub indicators. So in selecting a limited set of themes and sub indicators, efforts were made to reduce cross correlation between different sub indicators. Obviously, high cross correlation between sub indicators would imply that two or more sub indicators capture the same sustainability theme. In this case, the inclusion of one single indicator instead of several would be sufficient to adequately measure agriculture sustainability performances. All these decisions and choices obviously had an implication uh, for the choice of the sub indicator for the different dimensions, the choice of sustainability criteria for each sub indicator and the level of sophistication in, in data collection. With regard to measurement scope, as we are interested in assigning agriculture area sustainability statuses, the basic unit of observation and measurement are farms or agriculture holdings. With focus on those that primarily produce crops uh, and or livestock or its mix to check as to whether these are economically feasible, environment friendly and socially acceptable. So we include both intensive uh, and extensive agriculture holdings, as long as their primary activities are crops, uh, livestock, or, 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 or a mix of both. These may include holding that produce both food and not food products and crops grown for fodder or for energy purposes. The secondary activities are considered like aquaculture, agro, agroforestry are considered if and only if these activity take place on the agriculture area of the, of the holding. So we consider only on uh, holdings that produce crops and livestock. On top of these, if there are some minor activities uh, which are performed by the holding, those will be also part of the scope of the indicator. What is out of scope are the holdings which are exclusively focused on aquaculture and or agroforestry. We exclude from the scope production from gardens, backyards and hobby farms. 
food harvested from the wild is excluded from the scope. And lastly, common areas or common lands that are not exclusively managed by the agriculture holding and nomadic pastoralism is also not part of the scope of the SDG 241. The periodicity or reporting frequency of the indicator is set at three years due to, due to various uh, considerations. First, the SDG indicator 241 measure progress toward more productive and sustainable agriculture. And for many sub-indicators selected, it is unlikely that their values will change from one year to another. And secondly, the three year data collection and reporting will enable countries to have at least three data points on the indicator before 2030. This will also in turn help them to make a historical trend to assess their performances over time and for international agencies to compare as to how countries are, are doing vis-a-vis -vis each other. And last but not the least, uh, re having a three-year periodicity will reduce data collection and reporting burden on, on the countries. As mentioned earlier, Indicator 2.1 methodology is designed uh, whereby information is collected through farm surveys. Sustainability assessments are made at the farm level and the final results are expressed as a national value. However, the methodology is scale independent and can be adopted uh, for any geographical level though any introduction of additional stratification variables will certainly have implication for the sample size and thus the cost of uh, data collection. So in order to further enrich the analysis for making informed national policies, the indicator can be disaggregated at a subnational level and also according to different farm types as to whether the uh, agriculture holding is a household or non-household holding, whether it is focused on crops, livestock, or a mix of both, and whether the farm is using water to irrigate its agriculture area or not. The other certification variables that country may consider um, are um, size of farm and uh, gender of the holder of the agriculture holding. Now, as mentioned earlier, the indicator is multidimensional. Uh, this slide presents a table or matrix that includes everything that we need to know about this indicator. Towards the extreme left, you can see that the indicator cut across the three dimensions of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. Within each dimension, we have uh, a theme For instance, as you can see within the economic dimension, we have three themes or aspects and corresponding three sub indicators that are used to measure progress within, within those themes. Likewise, we have five themes in the environmental dimension and three in the social dimension. So in total, we have 11 themes and responding 11 sub-indicators. This decision was of course in relation to the measurability and cost effectiveness uh, as the list of issues and themes and the sub-indicators to measure and monitor sustainability is much longer um, that could be considered or captured. However, there was a feeling that capturing 11 in total would be a very good step forward. One other important consideration uh, to take note of is that we have developed a universal framework that covers the entire spectrum of agriculture, confronting sustainability issues that varies from one country to another, or one region to another within the same country, or one type of agriculture production system to another, that is household, non-household sector, and thus not all the sub-indicators are applicable to all kinds of farming systems. So as you can see, Within the social dimension, theme nine and sub-indicator nine, 
uh, which is uh, decent work and the sub indicator is wage rate in, in agriculture is only applicable to farm uh, that hire uh, unskilled uh, labor. And similarly, the sub indicator 10, which is food insecurity experience scale, which is indicator 2.1.2 uh, is only applicable to household farms. In addition, we have a different reference period for uh, some of the sub indicators, like say, for example, for profitability theme uh, and the net form income sub indicator, we have a reference period of three years. And so, so as well for uh, prevalence of soil degradation and variation on in, in water availability, we set the reference period uh, three years. We will explain, you know, the, the reference period uh, as we move into each sub indicator separately in my next presentation. As I said, the hardest choice for us was to limit the framework of SCG 241 to 11 themes and sub indicators. A series of expert discussions in meetings, consultations, literature review have shown that sustainability is so complex that in general, there is a much longer list of issues that can be considered to capture sustainability in agriculture. In this slide, you can see some issues that are considered important, but are not captured as part of SDG 241 framework. We still recommend countries to consider these themes and these aspects if these are relevant in their national or subnational context uh, in order to assess their sustainability of agriculture at a national level or subnational level. One critical aspect that we will discuss in detail as part of each sub indicator in the next presentation was developing an establishment of a threshold or sustainability criteria that will be used to assign sustainability statuses to each agriculture holding and the agriculture area that its own operates or manage. Briefly, thresholds or sustainability criteria are national policy based or international targets or science based absolute or relative values or levels below or above which for each sub indicator the farm is assigned sustainability status. So for each sub indicator criteria to assess sustainability levels have been developed. Now in order to capture the, 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 the concept of continuous progress towards sustainability, a traffic light approach was devised in which three sustainability levels are considered for each sub indicator. Green is considered as desirable, yellow acceptable, and red unsustainable. The traffic light approach acknowledges the trade-offs between uh, the trade-off existing between sustainability dimensions and themes, and the need to find an acceptable balance between them. Each sub indicator, is, as I already mentioned, is assessed at the level of agriculture holding and thereafter the sustainability level is associated with the agriculture land area of that particular agriculture holding. And then it is aggregated at the national level. Recollecting from the previous slide, the reporting of SDG 241 can be done at various levels using both a dashboard approach and an aggregate indicator. Let me clarify what we require from countries is to report on the, on the dashboard and aggregate indicator at the national level. What makes the dashboard approach more appealing is that it helps visualize the performances across the dimensions as well as across independent themes and sub indicators separately. This makes the dashboard policy relevant and actionable for policymakers, as it gives them the tool to quickly check at a single glance where the major problem lies, where to put in the emphasis 
what policies needs to be put in place and resources directed to address it to improve the situation. Um, an added advantage of the dashboard is that it allows the possibility of combining data from different data sources. The final aggregate indicator 241 is derived from the dashboard at the country level. Um, and the final number is, is a result of the sub indicator that has recorded the highest sustainability, unsustainability performance. This can be easily done either using the formula below or by looking at the dashboard and checking as to which sub indicators amongst the 11 has achieved the highest level of unsustainability. That is the highest level of red at the country level. So as you can see from this dashboard, it is fairly obvious that, you know, uh, with a single look, you can see that amongst the 11 sub indicators, profitability uh, theme or net farm income is the one that has recorded the highest level of unsustainability and hence the aggregate value of SG241 would be 40%. And this may change over time, uh, you know, as countries start monitoring uh, SG241. Now, the performances of countries over time can be measured by the change in the proportion of agriculture area that is unsustainable which is uh, the maximum unsustainability level achieved across the 11 sub indicator shown on the previous uh, shown, the, shown on the previous slide and in this case an increase in the value of uh, of uh, sdg 241 unsustainable or red uh, over time will indicate further degradation while a decrease in this value will indicate improvement We said in the beginning that policy relevance is very important uh, consideration while we were developing the framework for SEG 241. And in this respect, the dashboard approach is really interesting as it provides a structured and transparent framework to measure and report on sustainable agriculture. It allows focus on main issues related to sustainability and encourage discussion by linking it to policy actions. And lastly, it drives the policy towards agriculture sustainability issues with focus on interventions at, uh, at various levels. And additionally, um, it, it is, the dashboard is easy to interpret in terms of the extent to which the country agriculture is far from being productive and sustainable and easy to prioritize identify and prioritize the area that require, that require attention. So I will stop here. Yes. Perfect. So in the previous presentation, as Stefania mentioned, we learned about the conceptual and methodological basis of SDG 241, that is its scope, coverage, themes, sub-indicators, periodicity, uh, reporting, et cetera. In this session, we will go through the 11 themes and 11 sub-indicators of SDG 241 in turn, particularly focusing on the rationale for including the themes and the sub-indicators, the data items required to construct the sub-indicators, and the sustainability criteria developed to assign the agriculture holding and its agriculture land area, red, green, or yellow statuses. So as highlighted in, in, in my previous presentation, SDG 241 is defined using the simple formula, which is area under productive and sustainable agriculture divided by agriculture land area. Now let us focus on the denominator, which is based on foul land use classes. As such, countries have been providing national level statistics and will via the relevant FAO state questionnaire to FAO. 
Very importantly, the same land use classes are collected by census, which automatically addresses the issue of common land. In other words, the agriculture census does focus on farms only, just like two for one, and exclude common land along the lines of SDG 241. So we focus on agriculture land area, a well-established and well-known concept, which is derived by adding cropland and land under permanent meadows and pastures. Now for estimation of the agriculture land area and these classes, we adhere to the system of environmental economic account for agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, and World Census of Agriculture 2020, its standards and classification systems. Another important point to take note of is that the land tenure of agriculture holding, particularly from 241 point of view, the scope include the entire agriculture land area, which is owned and operated by the holding, or the agriculture land area, which is rented in, or land which is borrowed for free or occupied, or you know, common land managed by the holding exclusively. Now, as you can see from this very simple example, Parcel, parcel one, which is composed of field one and field two, is owned and used by an agriculture holding. So this will be part of the scope of 241. Parcel two is again owned and used. So this will be part of the scope of uh, SDG 241. Parcel four though it's not owned by the agriculture holding but it's rented in so it will be included as part of the scope of 241 while parcel 3 which is owned by the holding but it's, it's rented out to another agriculture holding and hence this will be excluded as as for that particular agriculture holding is concerned so if you know the parcel 3 will be considered as part of the sustainability assessment of the other holding, which is renting it in. So I hope, I hope this is clear. The indicator framework, this slide illustrates once again, the framework of SU 241, the three dimensions, economic, environmental, and, uh, and social. And you know, the fact that some indicators are applicable only to a certain kind of farm types and some indicators have different reference period. And I will explain it to you as to why we are using different reference period for some indicator while for other we are, we are using last calendar year. So before going into the detail of respective sub indicator, let me provide you with the generic steps that will be used to estimate each sub indicator. So once relevant qualitative information is collected through agriculture surveys and thereafter checked, cleaned, validated and stored on computer as Excel spreadsheets, it must then be transformed into appropriate quantitative primary variables that are in turn used to construct the 11 sub indicators of 241. A set of scripts, routines and procedures uh, typically carried out with statistical software such as Stata, SPSS or R are applied to the survey data for constructing the primary variables that will in turn be combined to construct each sub indicator. So the economic dimension. So the first dimension within the framework of 241 is economic. 
of which the first, the theme is land productivity and the sub indicator is farm output value per, per hectare. This indicator is applicable to all farm types. And when I say all farm types, remember in the previous presentation, I showed you the different typologies of the farm. Okay. So we have household farms and non-household farms. We have holdings which are focused only on crops, holding only specialized in livestock related activities and holding which produce a mix of both life crops and livestock. And then the third typology is as to whether this holding is user, using water to irrigate its agricultural land area. The reference period for this sub indicator is last calendar year. Now, let me explain as to what we mean by land productivity in context of, uh, of this sub indicator. As all of you may know, land productivity is a measure of agriculture value of outputs obtained on a given area of land for a given period of time. At farm level, land productivity reflects technology and production processes for a given agroecological condition. In a broader sense, an increase in the level of land productivity enables higher production per unit of land. Now, land productivity is driven by a combination of multiple factors, which include climate, soil quality, topography, land use, and its management. But in addition to this, the land productivity varies also in time. This variability in land productivity occurs at different time scales from seasonal to interannual um, in response to variability in rainfall and many other uh, weather or climate related uh, uh, factors. In the context of 241, we use the same classical approach to estimate land productivity. That is, first, the farm output value in local currency unit is estimated, which is then divided by the agriculture land area measured in hectares. And lastly, the farm productivity is then compared with the um, uh, farm output value of hectare of the distribution um, of you know of, of the farms that are part of the part of the sample so for this indicator uh, the for estimating the uh, farm output value of hectare we have the following formula which i explained on the previous slide too so we estimate the farm output value and divided by the agriculture land area, which is estimated in hectares. So for, for us to estimate the value of output, what we need is physical quantities of the products produced by the agriculture holding and the farm gate prices of those uh, uh, agriculture products. So in case of a typical agriculture holding, we would collect information on five main crops and its byproducts produced in the last calendar year. Five main livestock raised or produced and its products produced by the holding in the last calendar year. And the fact if the farm is producing uh, other unfarmed products as secondary activity then its quantities and farm gate pro, uh, and farm gate prices. Secondly, we would need agriculture land area of the farm, which is the denominator of the indicator. We need to categorize farms by different types, which I explained on the previous slide. And then we in turn will compare the given farm output value per hectare or its productivity with the with that of the distribution of farms selected as part of the sample to arrive at the thresholds so let me let me walk you through the steps as to how we are going to do it so here is an example of typical crops and its byproduct produced by a holding the actual list of crops and its byproduct of course, 
will vary from one country to another and from one agriculture holding to another depending on which region of the country this farm is located. So this is just a mere example. So what we would need is, we would need the quantity of maybe two or three or four, maximum five crops produced by the agriculture holding, and then the byproducts of these crops produced by the holding. So both the quantities and the farm gate prices. Now, this slide summarizes the list of other on-farm products and activities that the holding may be carrying out as secondary activities alongside its primary activities. This list is taken from International Standard Industrial Classification Revision 4 or ISAAC Revision 4. Now, depending on whether these other on-farm activities or commodities contribute to the farm revenues, if yes, then it must be included in the estimation of farm output value per hectare or else if the farm is not engaged in these activities, then it can be ignored. Now, the very first step for us is to categorize farms by different types, which I explained to you earlier as part of the stratification, which is recommended by FAO. Now, why we are recommending this stratification for different farm typologies? The reason basically is to compare likes with likes. So we want to compare uh, same agriculture holdings with similar agriculture holdings in terms of their productivity performance. So as we have three typologies uh, as part of uh, the recommendation, which is household and non-household, then we have crops, livestock and mixed. And then as to whether this holding is using water for irrigation or not, we arrive at 12 different combinations of farm typologies. So let's say, for example, the first typology, it could be a crop producing agriculture holding in the household sector, and it's using water for irrigation. Or it could be a household farm focused on livestock activities with irrigation uh, available. Or it could be a non-livestock uh, on, on a non-household farm with livestock activity and with irrigation facilities. So again, let me reiterate, the purpose behind us categorizing farms by these different typologies is to make sure that basically we compare apples with apples and oranges uh, with, uh, with oranges. As an example for a, for, a, for a given farm, the output value at farm level is estimated by first multiplying the quantities of each crop, livestock, and its products or byproducts if available by its respective farm gate prices. These measures are expressed in local currency units and represents the numerator of the farm output value per hectare for that particular farm. And is then divided by the farm agriculture area to estimate the, the land productivity for that, particular, for, for that particular farm. So this is this, this one I just explained. This is an example which, which is, has been taken from the pilot tests that we conducted in Bangladesh last year. So here you have the crops produced by a given agriculture holding. So this is holding identification number. And this is, these are the different uh, crops. These are the quantity of crops. These are the farm gate prices just by simple multiplication of these two, we arrive at the farm output value for that particular crop. We add up all these to arrive at the total 
sum output value. So once the farm output value per hectare has been calculated for all farms, mind you, you know, we, we have categorized farms by different types. Then each category of farms are ordered from lowest to highest in terms of their farm output value per hectare. Okay, so we order it from lowest to highest. And then we try to estimate the farm output value per hectare corresponding to the 90th percentile identified using this very simple formula. Okay, so we will have, you know, basically different distribution for each farm type. And then, you know, we order the farms by productivity from lowest to highest. Then we identify the 90th percentile using this formula, which is nothing but 0.9 into a total number of observations or total number of farms as part of the sample for that particular category. So the 90th percentile in this case is estimated to be 600. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, we have established thresholds. Okay, we have established thresholds for each sub indicator for us to assign the farm and its agriculture area sustainability status. So the way we have uh, drafted or the way we have developed the thresholds for, for this particular sub indicator, we have two thresholds which are derived from the 90th percentile. So first we multiply the 90th percentile with the two thirds to estimate, you know, the the productivity, uh, uh, which is which is two thirds from the 90th percentile, and then we estimate one third of the 90th percentile to estimate the second threshold. Based on these two thresholds, then we will see as to whether a give the given farm output value per hectare is whether above the two third between these two or less than the one third. To, for us to assign the green, yellow, and red statuses. So these two thresholds are then used to assign, as I mentioned, red, green, and yellow sustainability statuses to the farm and the agriculture area that it owns or operates. So in, in general, the sustainability status of agriculture holding is determined depending on whether or not the farm output value per hectare is above, below, or between the threshold set for the category of farm to which it belongs. So the green is, if the farm output value per hectare is equal to or greater than the value corresponding to the two third of the 90th percentile estimated for the distribution of categories of farm to which this farm belongs. So if the farm output value per hectare is above two thirds, it will be classified as green. If the farm output value per hectare is between two thirds and one third, then it will be classified as yellow. And if the farm output value per hectare is less than one third of the 90th percentile, then it will be classified as, as, as red. So this is an example, again, from uh, the Bangladesh tests that we carried out back in 2018 and 19. So for each category of farm, so this is the, the first category, crop, household, ir ir irrigated. The 90th percentile is estimated to be 600. The corresponding two third of the 90th percentile is 400. And one third of the 90th percentile is 200. And likewise, we have estimated for, for, for uh, another typology of farm and, and, and then for, for, for the third one. So taking the same example from Bangladesh. So the land productivity for holding one is estimated to be 900. It belongs to crop, household, sector and irrigated. The 90th percentile value from the distribution is estimated to be 600. Two third of the 90th percentile is 400 and one third is, is 200. 
So in this case, 900 is above the two third of the 90th percentile. Hence, this form will be classified as green. For the second one, the productivity of the farm is estimated to be 300. The two third and one third threshold are, are depicted here. It falls within these two values. So 300 falls within 533 and 267. Hence, it will be classified as yellow. And the third one is 200. And the, it's below the, below the one third of the 90th percentile and hence it will be classified as, as red. So then what we do is we aggregate the agriculture area associated with farms that were classified as green, yellow, and red to estimate the proportion of uh, agriculture area for this particular sub-indicator. So, and that's it. I'm, I'm, so, so let's go into the next sub, sub indicator within, within the economic dimension of SCG241. Um, as you may be aware, an important part of sustainability in agriculture is the economic viability of the farm, which is driven to a larger extent by its profitability. In the context of 241, profitability is measured using the net farm income that the farm is able to earn from farming operations. Um, now, availability and use of information on farm economic performance measured using profitability will support better decision making both at the micro and, uh, and macro levels. So, since performance measure drives behavior, better information on performance can alter behavior and decision making by the government and producers, both in the large scale commercial farming or the non-household sector and medium and small scale subsistence agriculture or household farms. So the dimension is economic, the theme is profitability, the coverage again is all farm types and the reference period is last three calendar years. Now I'll explain to you as to why we, we are resorting to three calendar years instead of, instead of last calendar year, which was the case with profitability, with the productivity sub indicator. So, um, the SDG 241, uh, we provide two options or two approaches to countries on how to report on this sub-indicator, okay? So one is a more sophisticated approach, which we, which we recommend to countries to, 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 to put in place. And the second one is a simpler approach or simplified approach, which is based on, on uh, farmer's declaration about about the economic viability or profitability of uh, his or her agriculture holding. Now, using the sophisticated approach, the, the, the more data demanding approach, okay, um, the net farm income is calculated using the formula, which is given below, net farm income, uh, and each variable which is which constitute this formula is described in turn. So CR is total farm cash receipts, including direct program payments. So I will now explain uh, direct pro program payments because it was one of the question. So the farm cash receipts, what does it mean? Cash receipt means you produce something and then you sell a specified quantity in the market at a certain price. And, 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 you know, those are your cash receipts because, you know, you receive cash and you, you record that. Now, the direct program, uh, program payments, which I will show you, or maybe, maybe let me explain it to you directly. These are the payments which are directly given by the government to the farmer. Incentivizing him to produce, uh, you know, produce more. So these are payments by the government or support payment by the government to ensure 
a minimum level of production of a certain commodity because of it could be because of many reasons because of food security because of uh, ensuring um, employment in agriculture sector so the direct program payments are direct monetary um, um, assistance given by the government to the farmers to encourage production in agriculture then we have income in kind which is yk then we have total operating expenses after rebates this includes labor cost as well we have depreciation and then we have value of inventory change of agriculture produce so how much was the agriculture produced in the beginning of the year how much it is at the end of the year so whether there were there are some storage facilities uh, or whether if it is a livestock then what was the value of the livestock at the beginning of the year and what was the value of the livestock at the end of the year so we need to estimate the age um, age sex profile of the livestock at the beginning of the period and at the end of the period for us to estimate the value of inventory change so this is more of an a sophisticated approach which is uh, which is uh, offered um, um, by by fao and this is adopted from statistics canada okay um, it is primarily um, uh, um, recommended for use by countries where the financial records the farm financial records uh, are are adequately maintained on daily weekly monthly or yearly basis in general large scale commercial farms or non household sector maintain detailed financial records using which the net farm income can be can be calculated so what we require so i explained earlier so the value of output is total farm cash receipts plus direct program payments from the government to the farmer to encourage the production plus income in kind if there is any and change in inventory so for farm cash receipts what we need is quantity into farm gate prices for crops livestock and other farm activities or products these are the same variables which were used to estimate the productivity for the for the previous sub indicator so until this point we, we we are in sync in terms of our data with the with the with the indicator on productivity then direct pro program payments which i explained to you what it means income in kind it could be income which is received by the agriculture holding in terms of uh, in terms of commodities and then value of inventory change which i explained to you we usually estimate value of inventory change for livestock uh, uh, producers as towards the value of the livestock at the beginning of the year how many of the livestock were bought between the year how many were sold how many were slaughtered how many got dead and then we estimate the balance at the end of the year to to estimate this value of inventory change on the cost side this is this is the information which is in addition to what is required by the productivity indicator so here we require labor expenses both cash wages and in kind fertilizer expenses pesticide expenses fuel expenses electricity cost for feeding animal irrigation costs taxes depreciation charges and others so this sophisticated approach if someone is interested in in or in, in understanding more about this we have i have provided a link here you can simply click there and go there for you to understand all these uh, all these variables and data items as to what what does it constitute now then i mentioned that apart from the sophisticated approach which is which is really applicable to household large scale commercial farm which keeps good financial records of their operation throughout the year um we offer two simplified approaches so the first simplified approach is to be used when detailed data are not available at the farm level so this is better adopted to the small holder or the household sector in this case what we need is output quantity and farm gate prices again of crops livestock and products and by products whether it's marketed or self consumed irrespective um then we need operating expenses including input quantity and its market prices and then um, output quantity and farm gate prices of other non farm 
commodities. For this option, we ignore depreciation and value of inventory change. So this is the, the first simplified option. And the third uh, option, which is the second simplified option, which is proposed is respondent declaration on agriculture holding profitability over the last three calendar years. As to whether this holding, particular holding, was uh, economically making profits uh, in the past three years. Um, the second simplified option is, pro is, is basically part of the uh, SDG indicator survey questionnaire that I, we will show you tomorrow. So, um, which is, uh, which is uh, a more straightforward way of, uh, of us uh, assessing as to whether, you know, this farm is uh, economically viable. Now, how we assign the green, yellow, and red status to a, to a given agriculture holding. So the farm is labeled as green or classified as green. If its profitability is above zero for, for all past three consecutive years, okay? It's classified as yellow. If its profitability is above zero for at least one of the past three consecutive years and it is classified as red if its profitability is uh, below zero for all three past consecutive years. So just to exemplify, in this case, this particular farm was profitable in two out of three years, hence it is classified as yellow. The farm was profitable in three out of three years, and it's classified as green and the farm was unprofit unprofitable or has profitability below zero in all three past consecutive years, and hence it is considered as unsustainable. Now, I understand that, you know, if you use this more sophisticated approach, which is um, um, adopted from State Statistics Canada, you will have to collect this information on yearly basis for three consecutive years for you to be able to assign sustainability statuses to these farms, hence, Instead of uh, this more sophisticated approach, we recommend countries to use this second simplified option whereby, you know, an agriculture holding um, himself declare as to whether his holding was profitable in the past three years. Uh, this is in relation to reduce the um, data collection uh, burden at the, at, the, at the country level. So in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the data that we have uh, collected using the Bangladesh tests, um, what, we, what we do is then we combine the farms and its agriculture area, which were classified as green, uh, yellow, and red. We divided by the total uh, nationally representative agriculture area to arrive at the proportion of uh, agriculture area, which is classified as green, yellow, and red. So I, okay, so the third and the final sub-indicator in the economic dimension is the risk mit mitigation mechanism. So the dimension is of course economic, the theme is resilience, uh, the coverage is all farm types, and the reference period for this uh, sub-indicator is uh, is uh, last uh, is last uh, calendar uh, calendar year. Um, resilience has uh, emerged as a key factor in sustainability. Resilience encompass absorptive, anticipatory, and adoptive capacities, and refer to the properties of the system that allow farms to deal with external shocks and stresses to persist and continue to be well functioning. Uh, in the sense of providing stability, um, predictability, security, uh, and other benefits to the, to the agriculture holding. So in the context of, um, of two for one, um, we considered um, um, the following uh, external shocks. So drought, flood, pest attack, or market shock. 
and uh, you know drought as you as you may know is a prolonged period of abnormally low rainfall leading to shortages of water flood is an overflow of large amount of water beyond its normal levels especially over what is normally dry land pest a destructive insect or other animal that attacks crops food livestock etc um and then market shocks any demand demand or supply shocks that that alter the price uh, matching equilibrium in the market price reduction for the commodity produced by the holding uh, or or increase in um, input prices etc um is a shock coping mechanism or mitigation strategy um uh, we we propose uh, three um, uh, you know features um access to insurance um that is preventive which is pro preventive protection measure to protect the holding against external shocks access to credit uh, both uh, both from formal and informal sources such as bank relatives uh, or local money lenders and the fact if the farm or the agriculture holding is diversified and when i say diversified it means that the share of a single agriculture commodity produced or activity uh, carried out is not uh, greater than 66% uh, in the total value of production of the holding or the revenues of the holding so um basically uh, we 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 use these three mechanisms to assess as to whether the agriculture holding is um, is uh, is resilient um, uh, in terms of managing its uh, its risk so i mentioned to you the formula for on farm diversification is very simple all you have to do is to take the a uh, total value of production of uh, of a given commodity and divide by total value of production of the farm if it is greater than um, 66% this means that the farm is reliant on a single commodity for uh, for uh, for its revenues or for its uh, production and hence in case of a market shock or in case of uh, a climatic shock uh, the farm revenues or production is very much susceptible um because it's relying on one single source of uh revenue or one single source of production um for its operations but if it is less than 66% this means that you know the farm is producing at least two commodities uh in 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 in, a, in proportions whereby if if there is a pest attack or if there is market failure for one commodity there is still another one on which the farm can rely for its uh, for its uh, to sustain itself so the way the uh, the red yellow and green status is are assigned to the farm and and its um, and its agriculture area we assess as to whether the farm has access to or availed uh, you know that this uh, these three me mitigation mechanisms so if the farm has access to or availed at least two of the three mitigation mechanisms it is uh, classified as uh, as green if it has access to one of the three mitigation mechanism then it's classified as yellow uh, and if the farm has access to none of these mechanisms uh, so if uh, if it is a if it is a highly specialized farm growing only one crop it has no access to credit it has no access to insurance then this means that you know it it is not resilient enough uh, to survive in case of uh, market failure or any external external shocks related to climate or weather so based on the bangladesh tests um as you can see here from the table um the share of a single commodity and the total value of output of a farm is 76% so this means that the farm is uh, not diversified um but 
uh, so you know it's given a value zero it has access to credit so it has a value one it has access to insurance it has a value one so two out of three the form is considered as desirable secondly um, the share of a single commodity less than 66 percent commodity two is 33 percent commodity four is 34 percent so this means that the farm is relying on three agriculture commodities for its uh, for its revenues or its production hence it's one it doesn't have access to credit or insurance only it fulfills only one mitigation criteria it's classified as acceptable and then you know the third form for which it is a you know single commodity producer farm 100 percent specialized in one kind of agriculture uh, commodities um, it doesn't have access to any other mitigation mechanism and hence it is considered as unsustainable or red now the information for 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 diversification because um, basically we are estimating a ratio based on what is the total value what is the contribution of a single commodity within the total revenue of the farm in a given time period this is the same information which is which can be used not only for uh, for for the productivity indicator and profitability indicator but for this indicator as well so the same information is used here again to 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 provide data on on this indicator the only additional information uh, required for this indicator is to have question on as to whether this farmer has access to credit or access to insurance again lastly um, basically what we do is we estimate uh, the uh, we assign farms and you know the agriculture area that it owns manages and operates green yellow and red statuses we divide you know the respective green and yellow and red by nationally representative samples to calculate these proportions we stop here for today tomorrow first thing we start with the quizzes with the, the, the quiz related to this uh, subject and then we move forward with the other two uh, dimensions as Pandiar, for your information we have got a lot of compliments uh, for this session the participants really appreciated it and they said that your presentation were fantastic a lot of them were are saying this so really congratulations <laughs> no, I, 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 thanks to the participant for their very engaged uh, you know uh, mode of uh, interaction during this session i really enjoyed it so for me i mean not many things would be would be uh, maybe I, I i if there if there's still um, some unclarity on my behalf then please do write to us and we will be very happy to revert to you because of the shortage of time i may not have given you know a proper explanation or maybe not detailed enough explanation to you for you to understand as to and explain the point to you so please write to us i mean we will happily revert to you we have also other questions as I mentioned before as Pandia from the registration, but I mean, we will analyze all of them uh, later and uh, we will answer at the right moment. Uh, thank you uh, all of you uh, for this first day and we look forward to meet again you tomorrow, same time, same channel. <laughs> have a nice rest of the day. Bye-bye, Cole. Cool.